Hello. I was actually at another evangelism planning meeting today at a different church when I got the call that you were ahead of schedule. So I jumped in my car and I drove over here a little fast. And these two guys on the highway thought I was racing them. <laughs> so the faster I went, the faster they went. And if I slowed down, they slowed down. They pulled in front of me, put their brakes on. I passed them, put my brakes on, they passed me. They took the Raytown Road exit, and so did I. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm in big trouble. But thankfully, some other cars got between us, and I just hurried up and pulled in the parking lot. So. A little excitement today on the way over here. We're going to have some fun today. This is a class. This is not a lecture. This is a class. There will be a test at the end of the world. How many of you want to pass? Right, you better pay attention then. We're going to talk about how to be to witness in times of trouble. This was the title that was given to me. I think it's a good one, don't you? Yeah. How do you prepare to witness to people and help them see God in the midst of pandemonium? And we are in the midst of pandemonium already. It's already beginning. Trouble is coming. The Bible says that we live in perilous times. We know this, right? We live in perilous times. It says in the Bible there will be great tribulation. If you were here last night, we thought about this for a little bit. There will be great tribulation, not like we've ever seen before in the world. How do you lift up a God of love in the midst of horrible things that we've never seen before? It's a good question, isn't it? The Bible says there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Is that happening? The prophetic time clock has already been set. We are already seeing prophecies being fulfilled before our very eyes. The Bible says in Matthew 24, the generation that sees all these things, they're the generation that's going to see the, the second coming of Jesus. We are seeing these things. And the Bible says in Matthew 24 that he who endures to the end will be saved. Evidently, God expects you to endure. Isn't that what that verse means? He who endures to the end will be saved. So God is saying, look, the good news is you can endure to the end. You can hang on to the end. You don't have to cave. You don't have to give up. You can hang in there and be used by God to help other people. God expects you to be a survivor of this horrible, sinful planet. Right? Somebody's got to be the last man standing. Why can't it be you? Why can't it be me? What is coming and what will you do? Here's how it goes. If I tell you right now that this church is on fire, a fire! Okay? Why aren't you moving? You don't believe me. Fire! Why are you moving? You don't believe. If you truly believe, if I cried fire and you truly believe, what would you do? You would grab your children, you would grab your purses, you would run out. It's the same way with what's happening in the world. If we are not preparing, what does it mean? We don't believe it's going to happen. Your degree of preparedness and my degree of preparedness to witness for God at the end of the world is dependent on what you believe. So what do you believe is coming in the world? What do you believe? Share with me. This is a class, remember? What is coming? The end is coming. What's going to happen between the end and this moment? Disease, Hell. destruction, war. if war, if you really believe that these things are going to happen, you really believe it, guess what? You're going to be prepared. It's just plain logic, isn't it? If I believe it's going to happen, then 
So what your level of real belief determines your level of preparation. So you need to sit down and have a little talk with yourself. Right? You need to sit down and have a little talk with yourself and decide what you really believe is going to happen. As you read the Bible, what do you see is going to happen? And when you see that from the Bible, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? And that is just basic common sense. That's what God wants us to do. Reason with him, think it through, decide what you believe, and then do something with what you believe. So if you really believe that these things are going to happen in the world, then what can you do to be prepared to help people see God? Isn't that what witnessing is? Help people see the love of God in the midst of horrible disaster. That is a struggle. Is that not a struggle? Even right now, when you and your family are afflicted with things, it is a struggle to keep our own perspective of a loving God when horrible things happen in our families. It is a challenge and it is a struggle. But God expects us to come out on top of this battle. He wants us to. And so we're going to talk today about how to make that happen. See, one of the things that you can do to witness for God is you hang on to God no matter what. Right? Then you're going to hang on to the hand of God no matter what this world throws at you. No matter what the devil throws at you. The worst possible witness that we could do is give up on God. Oh, I can't believe this is happening to me. I can't believe this is happening to my child. I can't believe this is happening to my friend. I can't believe this is going on in my church. The worst witness is to give up on God. I learned a long time ago when I stole the Bible and met Jesus that the most important thing for me to do was to follow Jesus. That people would always fail me. Maybe you haven't learned this yet. How many of you already know the lesson? Okay, people will fail you, not on purpose, but we're all sinners, right? We're all failures. And if we depend on each other so much that if you fall, I fall like dominoes, that's not how God intended it to be. He intended for me to depend on him. And if you fall, where am I? I'm still depending on God, right? And if I fall, where are you? You're still depending on God. So God didn't intend that for us to be dominoes. He intended us for being one-on-one -on -one with him and strong with him. If you want to witness from this point on to the end of the world, hang on to God and don't let go. If your whole church collapses at your feet, if your pastor apostatizes and goes off and does crazy stuff, if your husband or your wife or your children, you determine right now today, just take a minute right now and let's just tell God, God, I want to hang on to you no matter what. Let's just do that. Just do it in your own mind, okay? It's not hard, is it? Oh, I close my eyes and I say, God, I want to hang on to you no matter what. Please don't let anything pull me away from you. Do you know that when you get to heaven, there are going to be people in heaven that you do not know? And they're going to say to you, you know what? I watched you from a distance, and I saw all the horrible things that were happening to you. And you witnessed to me about the love of God, and you don't even know it. And I'm in heaven because of your faithfulness. If you want to be a witness at the end of the world... Follow the Lamb. Period. Right? You follow the Lamb. I follow the Lamb. You also need to rethink what you believe. If you want to witness to other people about the truth about God, you need to understand the truth about God. So I'm challenging you 
study day, and I'm going to give you homework at the end. Remember, this is a class. So, of course, you have homework. Duh. So, you're going to have homework. One of the things I want to challenge you to do is to go rethink what you think you believe. It's easy for us to get so complacent about what we believe. Take one truth that you think you believe and study it until you can teach it to somebody. Do not stop on that one truth until you know it well enough that you can teach it to somebody else. Is that fair enough? You don't know it until you can teach it. Until you can share it, you do not know it. So, it's very important. This is uh, what my website, you can go here and you see where it says, Be New Now Lessons. If you want a little help in understanding the truths of the three angels' message in a very personal, practical way, go there, print out those lessons or just Word documents, and there's only questions. You should get your answers from God. Right? Just work through those questions until you know that truth. And even if you didn't have a Bible, you could share that truth with other people. Look at the disciples in the New Testament. They were in jail. Did they have scrolls with them? Did they have Bibles, DVDs? How did they share the truth in jail with people that were in jailer, in jail and the jailer so that they became Christians? How could they do that? Get the point? They could do it because they knew it was, it was part of them. They had thought it through and thought it through, and they knew Jesus was the Messiah. They knew all the scriptures that related to that. They saw, saw the whole big picture, and they could boil that down into a few things to help somebody else learn. And that's what you need to do. We do not have time today to go through every major truth in Revelation 14, the message for the last days. But you could take the next few weeks and go through every one of those points until you can teach it. Um, we moved here from Iowa about a year ago, and there was a guy that came to some classes that we did in Iowa, and he learned, he was learning, you know, how to teach the truth to other people. So he wanted to practice. He wanted to learn it enough so that he could teach it. So he went home, and his wife is not a Christian. And he said, honey, please let me practice on you. She said, no. Please, just let, I'm taking these classes. I need something to practice on. She said, no. He said, all right, then. I'm going to convert the dog. <laughs> So he sat in the living room and he gave Bible studies to the dog. And that dog is going to be in heaven. <laughs> if you can't practice on somebody else, take one thing. Learn it. Teach it. Teach it to something. Go convert a tree. And speak it out loud. It, it's easy to know the truth in your head and in your heart. It's a whole different ballgame to speak it out with your mouth. So you need to practice. At the end of the world, and between now and the end of the world, there are going to be people in your path who want to know about God. And you are going to have to speak it with your mouth. And it will be easy. If you know it in your head, you know it in your heart, and you've practiced it will be easier. It's time in this world that we get ready for what's coming. We know what's coming. We've been told for years. We have volumes of books telling us, get ready, get ready, get ready. If you want to witness and be prepared to witness and help people in times of trouble that are coming in this world, then you need to get ready for what's coming. Disaster, earthquake, famine, pestilence, world war, all these things are coming. What do you think you need to be prepared for those things? You need knowledge, you need skills, you need things. You know, what, get a bug out bag. How better could I help my neighbors than if there's a disaster 
in my town that I'm prepared and I have supplies and I have extra food and I have extra water. We are doing a preparedness seminar right now at our church. And this past Wednesday night, there were two Mormon ladies there and they said something to me that I thought we should adopt as a church. A fed neighbor is a happy neighbor. Isn't that good? How better could we prepare to witness for people than to be prepared for what's coming ourselves so that we can help people? When there's total disaster, say a, a tornado comes through here and just total demoralizes our city and demolishes it. Okay, no problem, come over to my house. You see what I'm saying? We win people. Think of how Jesus witnessed to people. He met their needs, right? He met their physical needs, and then he won their heart. We can do the same thing. If you believe what is coming in this world, you prepare for it. Not only are you not afraid when stuff happens, but you're prepared for it, and you're prepared in a way that you can help other people. The difference between, let's say, me and a doomsday prepper. Have you seen that show on TV? Okay, I'm a Christian preparing for what's coming in the world. A doomsday prepper says, I'm going to prepare to survive myself, and if you think I'm going to help you, I will shoot you. Isn't that like stockpiling ammunition and stuff and, you know, putting electric wires all around my property because I'm going to keep you out? Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about be prepared to let people in. Be prepared to help people in need. I can only do that if I'm prepared myself. I can stockpile some food and water and be prepared. I can learn some things about medical emergencies. There's a book, and on your handout at the back, I have some resources for your homework. But there's a book called Where There Is No Doctor. Do you realize that we've been told at the church for over 100 years that we should learn medical emergency skills because at the end of the world, that is one way we can reach people for God. When all these things in Matthew 24 are happening, it will overwhelm the medical system. And we, if we have a little knowledge, we can help people and maybe save a life. So what we're, we're learning, we're not just learning for ourselves, we're learning to help other people. And it's very important that we do that. People are hurting today, have you noticed? People are depressed, people are dealing with anger and guilt and bitterness. Every time something bad happens in our family, my husband always says, don't get bitter. Because we know bitter people. And bitterness is a nasty pill to swallow. And bitterness is very contagious. Have you noticed? Very contagious. How do you deal with anger? How do you help a person that has anger issues? How do you help a person that's depressed? Here's what we've done. We have said, okay, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, right? So here's what we've said. Let the pastor deal with that. Right? I have a friend, they're bitter. Go see the pastor. What is wrong with that? We need to figure out how to deal with these things from a biblical point of view and then be able to be used by God to help people. As people, one out of three people die of cancer. Right? One out of two Americans die of heart attacks and heart disease. Over half of people are divorced. Like, you can look up the statistics, right? Depression is rampant. Diabetes is rampant. People are leaving churches because of anger issues and guilt. The number one reason people leave the Adventist church is guilt. They don't measure up. They feel like they don't measure up. How do you deal with these things? Your homework, should you choose to accept it, is to 
take one of those emotional problems and study it out in the Bible until you can help somebody. Because I guarantee you, speaking as a pastor's wife, we all need help. We all need help. And there are people in your life every week that if you study the topic out, you could give them a little help. But here's the thing. Don't help somebody that doesn't want help. Right? Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Why not? What does a pig care about a pearl? A pearl is nothing. So don't give people what they don't want. But if people want help, and you have some biblical foundation that you can help them with some of these struggles they're having, they're having. This is not just, you know, God didn't say, look, in all the Christian world, only pastors can deal with people problems. Is that how it is? No. Or should it be, as Christians, we are here to help people with their problems. Right? So, the things that you have been through already, that have made you the person that you are, those are the same kind of things that probably God will use you to help others. You want to witness? Then help people that are struggling with what you struggled with. You know, the path that you've been down, pe find people that are on that path, or God will even put people in your pathway that have those same kind of struggles, and you can help them. Jesus said, if you did it unto the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. We need to be willing to put our faith in action. Right? We, I went to the doctor the other day, and I was sitting there. I actually have a job condition where I'm only supposed to talk one hour a month. <laughs> Impossible. So I was getting a torture treatment, deep tissue massage in my face, and I had tears streaming down my face and everything. And uh, the guy, the doctor said, why are you so happy, Angie? Like somebody that has so much pain, how can you be so happy? How can that be? I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And he said, oh. <laughs> And it's all going to 
Right now, we're in the preparation for what is going to overtake the world like an overwhelming surprise. If you do not take this seriously, you're going to flunk the class. Right? You will flunk the test. Not only that, but you'll miss opportunity to help other people pass the test. So you need to prepare. There's what else needs to happen to wake us up? What else could happen? There, there's terrorism. People are getting their heads cut off because they're Christians. There are earthquakes. Like I have an earthquake app on my phone. Even today, there's like a hundred earthquakes today. Right? Earthquakes in Oklahoma, in Colorado, St. Louis, all over the place. There's an earthquake all over the world. Like unprecedented numbers. What else needs to happen? I don't know what else could happen that could wake us up. We need to wake up and we need to prepare and get ready. I want to look at this homework with you. See, I don't believe that these few minutes that we're sharing together should be wasted, personally. I, I am not the type of person that I, I just want to go to a class, sit there through the class, have my brain tickled a little, and then go home and forget about it. It's a waste of time, isn't it? It's a waste of my time, it's a waste of your time to do that. Because we have over, we have information overload. We hear so many things. It just goes in and goes out. It has little effect on us. It's like Splenda. You know what Splenda is? Splenda is an artificial sweetener. You eat it. It goes straight through your body. It changes not one bit. Straight through your body. It does nothing. Okay? You don't absorb one speck of it. It just goes straight through you. I don't think the truth is supposed to be that way, do you? I think we need to think about it, we need to chew on it, we need to digest it. So your homework, okay? Your homework is going to be some stuff. And I want to show you some stuff, okay? <laughs> on the second page, it says assignments. Now I'm just tr trying to share some things with you that have helped me, I think they would help you to help others. Witnessing is helping other people, right? If the only way I can witness is if I have been helped with that myself. I can't authentically share Jesus with you if I don't know Jesus, right? And I can't help you in areas where you need help if I don't know the, the help myself. It's not real. I can't go out and tell people what my church believes unless I believe what my church believes. Does that make sense? So your homework is rethink what you believe. A lot of us are doing evangelistic meetings that are coming up. I expect every one of you to be in that evangelistic series as a learner. I don't care if you're the head elder or the greeter or the deaconess or if you're the parking attendant, we need to rethink what we believe and restudy it and restudy it and restudy it. Because every time you go through it, God will take you one layer deeper in that topic. Now, I've been a Christian for 30 some years, okay? And I've been studying and I've, I've done evangelism, I've been to I don't know how many evangelistic meetings, and I, so far I think I know this much. Okay, how much do you think you know? If you think you know everything and you have it in the bag and you know, you're good to go, then don't go to any evangelistic meetings. And why should you even study the Bible? Well, you don't even really need to go to church, do you? Because if you know everything, what's the point? You see what I'm saying? We, we know so little. We are just scratching the surface. If ever there was a time we should be studying, it's now. Studying by ourselves, studying together in small groups, 
studying together in big evangelistic series and, and rethink it and restudy it and get it from a different angle. Everybody comes at it from a different angle. And it's good to see people's different perspectives on it because it will help you be more rounded. You can go to the site, be new now, and get those, download those questions and work through those questions on your own. There's books, there's tons of books. Go to the bookstore and buy a book. Here's one that says, How to Survive the End of the World as We Know It. Life is not normal anymore. Is it? Does it seem normal to you? It is not normal. We've reached a new plateau in world history. And all the things that we thought were normal are not normal now. Get a book like How to Survive the End of the World as We Know It. Study it. Apply it to yourself. Put into practice some of these things. And get ready for what Jesus said was coming in this world. Disasters and famines and earthquakes and terrorism and people's hearts failing them for fear. Get ready for that. Prepare. There are books out there like this one, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. You want to know how to help people that are hurting? Study about it. When you have a spare few minutes, open a book like this and read a few pages and learn how to help people that are hurting. There's another one called The Counsel of a Friend. And biblical days, how do you help people that are dealing with anger? How do you help people that are grieving? How do you help people that are suffering? How do you help people that are terminal? Right? How we face these kind of things every day, don't we? Study study up on it. And pretty soon people will be coming to you and they'll say, Hey, Tori, you know, my neighbor's dying of cancer. Come talk to them. Right? Why does that happen? Because you've earned the right to witness to people because you've already witnessed about those things. I have people say, Angie, you know, my teenager's getting into alcohol. Okay, I was an alcoholic. I can go talk to that person. I've already been there, done that. Got the scars to prove it. Right? Study up on some of these things. How do you help people that are drug addicts? How do you help these people? And there's another book called Christ's Way of Reaching People. If you don't have this book, get it and read it and see how Jesus dealt with people. If you have the book, we're at the end of the world. We're taking the class again. Read the book again. Right? Study it again. Study those things and prepare in January, I found out the University of Pennsylvania is putting on a disaster preparation class online for free. It's a six weeks course. I put the website on there. Go sign up for that class and learn. Here's what happens in disaster. People panic and there's like uh, post, what do you call that? Like soldiers come back? Post-traumatic stress disorder. So if some people are in that situation and you're there and you plan for this and you prepare for it and you can just be a calming voice for them, you may have earned your right right there to share God with them. You understand? If you want to prepare to be a witness at the end of the world, stay close to God yourself. Get prepared for what's coming. Learn how to help people with their emotional needs that they have. Learn all you can now in this time where we're in. We're between World War II and all of its horrors and the end of the world. Right? It's the Friday of the world. The end of the world is going to come. And God, more than anything, wants you to help his people be ready. So get ready yourself. If you have any questions about what I've shared, remember this is a class. The questions are all right, just you and me. Any questions? Yes. That's a great question. How do you help 
Bible, they don't go to church, they're, they're, you know, not committed to God. Like my sister one time told me, I believe in God, but man, I don't want to make him my whole life like you do. Right? So how do you help people like that? I think one of the best things that you can do is exactly what Jesus did. Invest time in those people. And let them drive the agenda. You do not drive the agenda in witnessing. The person drives the agenda. The Bible says, have an answer to give to everyone who asks you. What does that mean? Ah, Saturday Sabbath. When you die, you sleep. Don't you know that? What am I doing? Did he ask me? You know, do you, how many of you feed popcorn to a, a three-month-old baby? Please don't raise your hand. <laughs> we don't. We need to wait for the moment. To, we need to. We need to know the truth to be able to teach it, and then teach it to people that want to hear it, and stop trying to cram truth down people's throats. The worst thing you can do for your family is talk at them about the truth when they don't want to hear it. Take them out for lunch. Take them out for dinner. Go, if they like to do something, go do that with them. You know, if they like to go to ball games or you know see the Royals and win the World Series, go with them. Do, do with them what they like to do, and pretty soon they will begin to ask you questions. And when they ask you a question, because you've been studying it, and you've internalized it, and you own it, you'll be able to share it when they ask the question. Back off. We are not trying to win arguments with our family. We are trying to show them the love of God. Does that make sense? If people are resisting, I call it the dance. Okay? Mick, come up here with, for me for a second. So if Mick is my family member, horror. <laughs> <laughs> not be talking right if, now. If Mick is my family member and I and I'm a Christian and he's not, and I come at him with something about God, you know Jesus. If he starts resisting in any way, and you know how they do it, my mother was the same way. Don't talk to me about that garbage. That's what my mother said. So what I can do is back off. If I push more, what's going to happen? He's going to push back. Pretty soon, if Mick sees me, he's not even going to want to talk to me at all. So I need to find out, ask Mick questions. Jesus was a master at asking questions. So what does Mick like to do? What is Mick thinking about, right? And let him pull me into him. Instead of me imposing myself, let let the relationship just draw based on mix agenda, not mine. Does that make sense? If we push and push, you know what? Jesus told the story about the, the rich young ruler. Jesus said, follow me. What did he do, the rich young ruler? What did Jesus do? Did he like get right in his face? You can't leave me. Is that what Jesus did? You're not going past me. I said, follow me. No, I mean it. Follow me. What did Jesus do? Let him go. Jesus let him go. He didn't whine. He didn't chase him. He didn't try to force him. Sometimes I think in our families and with, with our friends, we love them so much. We want them to, to follow Jesus that we push back off. Even, you know, as going, going door to door and doing an evangelistic thing, one of the best things you can do, if somebody invites you into their home, don't go in. Don't do it. Because if you're there going door to door and they invite you in, they don't really want you to come in. Right? You don't even know them. They're strangers. Don't go in. Don't do it. Back off. And if you, like, rethink as you study the Bible, read the New Testament again, and see how the disciples and how Jesus kind of did the dance. Jesus, even with the Pharisees, he went forward a little bit, especially in his early ministry, he went forward a little, and what did the Pharisees do? Push. So Jesus backed off. And then Jesus went forward a little, 
the Pharisees pushed Jesus back off. He told stories around the topic, but didn't nail the topic. Right? It was kind of the dance. Jesus didn't really get raffy with the Pharisees until right before his death, because he knew it was his last chance. So he just told it like it was at the very end. Does that make sense? We are not here to force or push. Even God doesn't push us. We have free will, and God does not force or push us. I am free right now to go right back to my old life if I want to. So are you. But thankfully, we have this loving God. Why would I leave? Right? Any other questions? Yes. Okay, it's a bug out bag because you're going to grab it and bug out. Okay, a bug out bag is, contains everything you would need to survive for a period of time. So it has, it, it would have in it a way to get water. It would have food. It would have a way to stay warm, shelter. Okay, it would have a way to make a fire. It would have all the essentials that you could grab a bug out bag, walk off into the, the woods, and you could survive. Now, if that means if I could survive and you didn't have a bug out bag, I would share. Right? So, not only survival for me, but maybe survival for you. Uh, my husband and I were backpacking once. And it was really cold. I went to pour water in the pot to boil some water in the morning. And as I poured, the water froze going in and was frozen solid in the pot. It just so happened that about 20 minutes later, I fell in the river. <laughs> I did this stupid thing, and I fell in the river. And it was so cold. So, you know what? We had a sleeping bag. My husband hates cold, but he saved me. I got in the sleeping bag, and he let me put my feet on his bare chest so that they didn't freeze off. The best thing you can do to help somebody in a situation is get close to them and help them. And it may cost you something. It may be uncomfortable. I'll tell you what, I believe that we are going to be very uncomfortable at the end of the world. But if my discomfort would save somebody for eternity, then I say it's worth it. How about you? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Um, they're all on your handout, the books. They're in the homework section. I would say, you know, spend some time, dedicate some time, do the homework, learn some things. Yes? What, you have a question? Oh. Where would I start out, if I could, uh, with a plan for my church? Uh, to get a plan for your church, I would get a group together in your church and decide as a church, what do you think as a group that's going to happen? And this is kind of challenging. I've tried this with my own church. I believe of all the churches in the world that our churches should have a plan. So I would get a group together and say, you know, what do we think is going to happen? It's really driven by what you think. If all the people in your church think it's going to stay status quo and nothing is going to happen, they're not going to be motivated to do anything. But if you have a group of people and you say, here's what we think is going to happen, we believe this is going to happen, what should we do? What contact point should we have? Like, just something simple like this. If Sunday laws pass right now today, somebody looked at their phone, there's an app for that. Sunday law passed. What's your plan? Is that a prophetic mark in history? What's your plan? If there were a 
I heard that, I would be worried about her. Mom, I'm okay. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to account for each other and help each other. We have elderly people that maybe can't do for themselves. We should have a plan. So I don't know in your area. Get a meeting place. You know, first of all, get a meeting place. Try to make sure everybody has what they need. Would it be easier to survive if we all had a bug out bag or just me? You see, like I might have seven days of food in my bug out bag. How long can we all last at a piece of rice? See, the more, the more of us that are prepared, the better off we're going to be as a group. So it's really important. I have people, to, I do classes at Churches on Survival. I have people all the time tell me, Angie, we're not going to prepare for the end of the world. We're just going to come find you. <laughs> What's wrong with that plan? There's no responsibility on the person, a lot of responsibility on me. You understand? I'm not saying I would turn you away, but my meager stores aren't going to last very long. It would be better if we all prepare and we survive together. Wouldn't that be fair? So, at the end of the world, who are you going to pawn your responsibility off on? If you pawn it off on me and I don't make it, then what, what happens to your plan? What if I just get a wild hair and I don't even follow God anymore? Then what are you going to do? You need your own plan figured out as a group. So you get my email and phone numbers on there. You can email me questions, call me, whatever. When I do seminars or I speak, I put myself out there for you. Okay, I'm not just committed to this 50-minute time. I'm committed to you. I will do anything I can to help you be prepared for what's coming in the world. Let's pray. Father Nevin, I thank you so much for every person here. We do believe, God, what you said in Matthew 24, that this world is going to go down and it's going to be ugly. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us now to prepare, not just for ourselves to be survivors, but to prepare to help other people who might be fearful and in panic and hearts are failing them, Lord, for not knowing what's coming or what's going on. Please help us to study like we've never studied before. Help us to learn practical things that we can use to help other people in times of crisis. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to know when to speak a word and when to zip it and say nothing. Thank you so much, God, that we're not in this alone. We're in this together, and you are the leader. In Jesus' name.